Welcome to Lil Friday, featuring Louisa May Alcott's book, Little Women, read by Amber Jacoba, sponsored by Gals Guide. Chapter 3 The Lawrence Boy Joe, Joe, where are you? cried Meg at the foot of the garret stairs. Here, answered a husky voice from above, and running up, Meg found her sister eating apples and crying over the air of Redcliffe, wrapped up in a comforter on an old three legged sofa by the sunny window. This was Joe's favorite refuge, and here she loved to retire with half a dozen russets and a nice book, to enjoy the quiet and the society of a pet rat who lived nearby and didn't mind her a particle. As Meg appeared, Scrabble whisked into his hole, Joe shook the tears off her cheeks and waited to hear the news. Such fun! Only see! A regular note of invitation from Mrs. Gardiner for tomorrow night, cried Meg, waving the precious paper, and then proceeding to read it with girlish delight. Mrs. Gardiner would be happy to see Miss March and Miss Josephine at a little dance on New Year's Eve. Marmy is willing we should go. Now what shall we wear? What's the use of asking that when you know we shall wear our poplins, because we haven't got anything else, answered Joe, with her mouth full. If I only had a silk, sighed Meg. Mother says I may when I'm eighteen, perhaps, but two years is an everlasting time to wait. I'm sure our pops look like silk, and they are nice enough for us. Yours is as good as new, but I forgot the burn and the tear in mine. Whatever shall I do, the burn shows badly and I can't take any out. You must sit still all you can and keep your back out of sight. The front is all right. I shall have a new ribbon for my hair, and Marmy will lend me her little pearl pin, and my new slippers are lovely, and my gloves will do, though they aren't as nice as I'd like. Mine are spoilt with lemonade, and I can't get any new ones, so I shall have to go without, said Joe, who never troubled herself much about dress. You must have gloves or I won't go, cried Meg decidedly. Gloves are more important than anything else. You can't dance without them, and if you don't, I should be so mortified. Then I'll stay still. I don't care much for company dancing. It's no fun to go sailing round. I like to fly about and cut capers. You can't ask Mother for new ones. They are so expensive, and you are so careless. She said, when you spoilt the others, that she shouldn't get you any more this winter. Can't you make them do? asked Meg anxiously. I can hold them crumpled up in my hand, so no one will know how stained they are. That's all I can do. No. I'll tell you how we can manage. Each wear one good one and carry a bad one, don't you see? Your hands are bigger than mine, and you will stretch my glove dreadfully, began Meg, whose gloves were a tender point with her. Then I'll go without. I don't care what people say, cried Joe, taking up her book. You may have it, you may, only don't stain it, and do behave nicely. Don't put your hands behind you, or stare, or say Christopher Columbus, will you? Don't worry about me. I'll be as prim as I can, and not get into any scrapes if I can help it. Now go and answer your note, and let me finish this splendid story. So Meg went away to accept with thanks, look over her dress, and sing blithely as she did up her one real lace frill, while Joe finished her story, her four apples, and had a game of romps with Scrabble. On New Year's Eve, the parlor was deserted, for the two younger girls played dressing maids, and the two elder were absorbed in the all-important business of getting ready for the party. Simple as the toilets were, there was a great deal of running up and down, laughing and talking, and at one time a strong smell of burnt hair pervaded the house. Meg wanted a few curls about her face, and Joe undertook to pinch the papered locks with a pair of hot tongs. Ought they to smoke like that? asked Beth from her perch on the bed. It's the dampness drying, replied Joe. What a queer smell! It's like burnt feathers, observed Amy, smoothing her own pretty curls with a superior air. There, now I'll take off the papers and you'll see a cloud of little ringlets, said Joe, putting down the tongs. She did take off the papers, but no cloud of ringlets appeared, for the hair came with the papers, and the horrified hairdresser laid a row of little scorched bundles on the bureau before her victim. Oh, 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 what have you done? I'm spoilt. I can't go. My hair, oh, my hair, wailed Meg, looking with despair at the uneven frizzle on her forehead. Just my luck. You shouldn't have asked me to do it. I always spoil everything. I'm so sorry, but the tongs were too hot, and so I've made a mess, groaned poor Joe, regarding the black pancakes with tears of regret. It isn't spoilt. Just frizzle it and tie your ribbon so the ends come on your forehead a bit, and it will look like the last fashion. I've seen many girls do it so, said Amy consolingly. Serves me right for trying to be fine. I wish I'd let my hair alone, cried Meg petulantly. So do I. It was so smooth and pretty. 
but it will soon grow out again, said Beth, coming to kiss and comfort the shorn sheep. After various lesser mishaps, Meg was finished at last, and by the united exertions of the family, Joe's hair was got up and her dress on. They looked very well in their simple suits, Meg in silvery drab with a blue velvet snood, lace frills, and the pearl pin, Joe in maroon with a stiff, gentlemanly linen collar, and a white chrysanthemum or two for her only ornament. Each put on one nice, light glove and carried one soiled one, and all pronounced the effect quite easy and fine. Meg's high-heeled slippers were very tight and hurt her, though she would not own it, and Joe's nineteen hairpins all seemed stuck straight into her head, which was not exactly comfortable. But dear me, let us be elegant or die. Have a good time, dearies, said Mrs. March as the sisters went daintily down the walk. Don't eat much supper and come away at eleven when I send Hannah for you. As the gate clashed behind them, a voice cried from a window, "'Girls, girls, have you both got nice pocket handkerchiefs?' "'Yes, yes, spandy nice, and Meg has cologne on hers,' cried Joe, adding, with a laugh, as they went on. "'I do believe Marmy would ask that if we were all running away from an earthquake.' "'It is one of her aristocratic tastes, and quite proper, for a real lady is always known by neat boots, gloves, and handkerchief,' replied Meg, who had a good many little aristocratic tastes of her own." Now don't forget to keep the bad breadth out of sight, Joe. Is my sash right? And does my hair look very bad? said Meg, as she turned from the glass in Mrs. Gardner's dressing room after a prolonged prank. I know I shall forget. If you see me doing anything wrong, just remind me by a wink, will you? returned Joe, giving her collar a twitch and her head a hasty brush. No, winking isn't ladylike. I'll lift my eyebrows if anything is wrong, and not if you are all right. Now hold your shoulders straight and take short steps, and don't shake hands if you are introduced to anyone. It isn't the thing. How do you learn all the proper ways? I never can. Isn't that music gay? Down they went, feeling a trifle timid, for they seldom went to parties, and, informal as this little gathering was, it was an event to them. Mrs. Gardiner, a stately old lady, greeted them kindly, and handed them over to the eldest of her six daughters. Meg knew Sally, and was at her ease very soon, but Joe, who didn't care much for girls or girlish gossip, stood about with her back carefully against the wall, and felt as much out of place as a colt in a flower garden. Half a dozen jovial lads were talking about skates in another part of the room, and she longed to go and join them, for skating was one of the joys of her life. She telegraphed her wish to Meg, but the eyebrows went up so alarmingly that she dared not stir. No one came to talk to her, and one by one the group near her dwindled away till she was left alone. She could not roam about and amuse herself, for the burnt breaths would show, so she stared at people rather forlornly till the dancing began. Meg was asked at once, and the tight slippers tripped about so briskly that none would have guessed the pain their wearer suffered smilingly. Joe saw a big red-headed youth approaching her corner, and fearing he meant to engage her, she slipped into a curtained recess, intending to peep and enjoy herself in peace. Unfortunately, another bashful person had chosen the same refuge, for as the curtain fell behind her, she found herself face to face with the Lawrence boy. "'Dear me, I didn't know anyone was in here,' stammered Joe, preparing to back out as speedily as she had bounced in. But the boy laughed and said pleasantly, though he looked a little startled. Don't mind me. Stay, if you like. Shan't I disturb you? Not a bit. I only came here because I don't know many people and felt rather strange at first, you know? So did I. Don't go away, please, unless you'd rather. The boy sat down again and looked at his pumps, till Joe said, trying to be polite and easy, I think I've had the pleasure of seeing you before. You live near us, don't you? Next door. And he looked up and laughed outright, for Joe's prim manner was rather funny when he remembered how they had chatted about cricket when he brought the cat home. That put Joe at her ease, and she laughed too, as she said, in her heartiest way. We did have such a good time over your nice Christmas present. Grandpa sent it. But you put it into his head, didn't you now? How is your cat, Miss March? asked the boy, trying to look sober, while his black eyes shone with fun. Nicely, thank you, Mr. Lawrence, but I am not Miss March, I'm only Joe, returned the young lady. I'm not Mr. Lawrence, I'm only Laurie. Laurie Lawrence, what an odd name. My first name is Theodore, but I don't like it, for the fellows called me Dora, so I made them say Laurie instead. I hate my name, too. So sentimental. I wish everyone would say Joe instead of Josephine. How did you make the boys stop calling you Dora? I thrashed them. I can't thrash Aunt March, so I suppose I shall have to bear it. And Joe resigned herself with a sigh. Don't you like to dance, Miss Joe? asked Laurie, looking as if he thought the name suited her. I like it well enough if there is plenty of room, and everyone is lively. 
In a place like this, I'm sure to upset something, tread on people's toes, or do something dreadful, so I keep out of mischief and let Meg sail about. Don't you dance? Sometimes. You see, I've been abroad a good many years and haven't been into company enough yet to know how you do things here. Abroad, cried Joe. Oh, tell me about it. I love dearly to hear people describe their travels. Laurie didn't seem to know where to begin, but Joe's eager questions soon set him going, and he told her how he had been at school in Vevey, where the boys never wore hats, and had a fleet of boats on the lake, and for holiday fun went walking trips about Switzerland with their teachers. Don't I wish I'd been there, cried Joe. Did you go to Paris? We spent last winter there. Can you talk French? We were not allowed to speak anything else at Vevey. Do say some. I can read it, but can't pronounce. Quel nom cette jeune demoiselle en les pantoufles jolies, said Laurie good-naturedly. How nicely you do it. Let me see. You said, who is the young lady in the pretty slippers, didn't you? Oui, mademoiselle. It's my sister Margaret, and you knew it was. Do you think she is pretty? Yes, she makes me think of the German girls. She looks so fresh and quiet and dances like a lady. Joe quite glowed with pleasure at this boyish praise of her sister and stored it up to repeat to Meg. Both peeped and criticized and chatted till they felt like old acquaintances. Laurie's bashfulness soon wore off, for Joe's gentlemanly demeanor amused and set him at his ease, and Joe was her merry self again because her dress was forgotten and nobody lifted their eyebrows at her. She liked the Lawrence boy better than ever, and took several good looks at him so that she might describe him to the girls, for they had no brothers, very few male cousins, and boys were almost unknown creatures to them. Curly black hair, brown skin, big black eyes, handsome nose, fine teeth, small hands and feet, taller than I am, very polite for a boy, and altogether jolly. Wonder how old he is. It was on the tip of Joe's tongue to ask, but she checked herself in time, and, with unusual tact, tried to find out in a roundabout way. I suppose you're going to college soon? I see you pegging away at your books. No, I mean studying hard. And Joe blushed at the dreadful pegging which had escaped her. Laurie smiled but didn't seem shocked, and answered with a shrug. Not for a year or two. I won't go before seventeen, anyway. Aren't you but fifteen? asked Joe, looking at the tall lad, who she had imagined seventeen already. Sixteen next month. How I wish I was going to college. You don't look as if you liked it. I hate it. Nothing but grinding or skylarking, and I don't like the way fellows do either in this country. What do you like? To live in Italy, and to enjoy myself in my own way. Joe wanted very much to ask what his own way was, but his black brows looked rather threatening as he knit them, so she changed the subject by saying, as her foot kept time, That's a splendid polka. Why don't you go and try it? If you will come too, he answered with a gallant little bow. I can't, for I told Meg I wouldn't, because... There Joe stopped and looked undecided whether to tell or to laugh. Because what? asked Laurie curiously. You won't tell? Never. Well, I have a bad trick of standing before the fire, and so I burn my frocks, and I scorched this one, and though it's nicely mended, it shows, and Meg told me to keep still so no one would see it. You may laugh if you want to. It is funny, I know. But Laurie didn't laugh. He only looked down a minute, and the expression of his face puzzled Joe when he said very gently, Never mind that. I'll tell you how we can manage. There's a long hall out there, and we can dance grandly, and no one will see us. Please come. Joe thanked him and gladly went, wishing she had two neat gloves when she saw the nice pearl-colored ones her partner wore. The hall was empty, and they had a grand polka, for Lori danced well and taught her the German step, which delighted Joe, being full of swing and spring. When the music stopped, they sat down on the stairs to get their breath, and Lori was in the midst of an account of a student's festival at Heidelberg when Meg appeared in search of her sister. She beckoned, and Joe reluctantly followed her into a side room, where she found her on a sofa, holding her foot and looking pale. I've sprained my ankle. That stupid high heel turned and gave me a sad wrench. It aches so I can hardly stand, and I don't know how I'm ever going to get home, she said, rocking to and fro in pain. I knew you'd hurt your feet with those silly shoes. I'm sorry, but I don't see what you can do except get a carriage or stay here all night, answered Joe, softly rubbing the poor ankle as she spoke. I can't have a carriage without its costing ever so much. I dare say I can't get one at all, for most people came in their own, and it's a long way to the stable and no one to send. I'll go. No, indeed. It's past nine and dark as Egypt. I can't stop here, for the house is full. Sally has some girls staying with her. I'll rest till Hannah comes and then do the best I can. I'll ask Laurie. He will go, said Joe, looking relieved as the idea occurred to her. 
Mercy, no, don't ask or tell anyone. Get me my rubbers and put these slippers with our things. I can't dance anymore, but as soon as supper is over, watch for Hannah and tell me the minute she comes. They are going out to supper now. I'll stay with you. I'd rather. No, dear, run along and bring me some coffee. I'm so tired I can't stir. So Meg reclined with rubbers well hidden, and Joe went blundering away to the dining room, which she found after going into a china closet and opening the door of a room where old Mr. Gardner was taking a little private refreshment. Making a dart at the table, she secured the coffee, which she immediately spilt, thereby making the front of her dress as bad as the back. Oh dear, what a blunderbuss I am, exclaimed Joe, finishing Meg's glove by scrubbing her gown with it. Can I help you? said a friendly voice. And there was Lori, with a full cup in one hand and a plate of ice in the other. I was trying to get something for Meg, who is very tired, and someone shook me, and here I am in a nice state, answered Joe, glancing dismally from the stained skirt to the coffee-colored glove. Too bad. I was looking for someone to give this to. May I take it to your sister? Oh, thank you. I'll show you where she is. I don't offer to take it myself, for I should only get into another scrape if I did. Joe led the way, and, as if used to waiting on ladies, Lori drew up a little table, brought a second installment of coffee and ice for Joe, and was so obliging that even particular Meg pronounced him a nice boy. They had a merry time over the bonbons and mottos, and were in the midst of a quiet game of buzz with two or three other young people who had strayed in when Hannah appeared. Meg forgot her foot and rose so quickly that she was forced to catch hold of Joe with an exclamation of pain. "'Hush! Don't say anything,' she whispered, adding aloud. It's nothing. I turned my foot a little, that's all, and limped upstairs to put her things on. Hannah scolded, Meg cried, and Joe was at her wit's end till she decided to take things into her own hands. Slipping out, she ran down and, finding a servant, asked if he could get her a carriage. It happened to be a hired waiter who knew nothing about the neighborhood, and Joe was looking round for help when Lori, who had heard what she said, came up and offered his grandfather's carriage, which had just come for him, he said. It's so early, you can't mean to go yet, began Joe, looking relieved, but hesitating to accept the offer. I always go early. I do, truly. Please let me take you home. It's all on my way, you know, and it rains, they say. That settled it, and telling him of Meg's mishap, Joe gratefully accepted and rushed up to bring down the rest of the party. Hannah hated rain as much as a cat does, so she made no trouble, and they rolled away in the luxurious, close carriage, feeling very festive and elegant. Lori went on the box so Meg could keep her foot up, and the girls talked over their party in freedom. "'I had a capital time, did you?' asked Joe, rumpling up her hair and making herself comfortable. "'Yes, till I hurt myself. Sally's friend, Annie Moffat, took a fancy to me, and asked me to come and spend a week with her when Sally does. She is going in the spring when the opera comes, and it will be perfectly splendid if Mother only lets me go,' answered Meg, cheering up at the thought. "'I saw you dancing with the red-headed man I ran away from. Was he nice?' Oh, very. His hair is auburn, not red, and he was very polite, and I had a delicious radoa with him. He looked like a grasshopper in a fit when he did the new step. Lori and I couldn't help laughing. Did you hear us? No, but it was very rude. What were you about all that time hidden away there? Joe told her adventures, and by the time she had finished, they were at home. With many thanks, they said good night and crept in, hoping to disturb no one. But the instant their door creaked, two little nightcaps bobbed up and two sleepy but eager voices cried out, Tell about the party! Tell about the party! With what Meg called a great want of manners, Joe had saved some bonbons for the little girls, and they soon subsided after hearing the most thrilling events of the evening. I declare, it really seems like being a fine young lady to come home from the party in a carriage and sit in my dressing gown with a maid to wait on me, said Meg as Joe bound up her foot with arnica and brushed her hair. I don't believe fine young ladies enjoy themselves a bit more than we do, in spite of our burnt hair, old gowns, one glove apiece, and tight slippers that sprain our ankles when we are silly enough to wear them. And I think Joe was quite right. Chapter 4. Burdens Oh dear, how hard it does seem to take up our packs and go on, sighed Meg, the morning after the party. For now the holidays were over, the week of merrymaking did not fit her for going on easily with the task she never liked. "'I wish it was Christmas or New Year all the time. Wouldn't it be fun?' answered Joe, yawning dismally. "'We shouldn't enjoy ourselves half so much as we do now, but it does seem so nice to have little suppers and bouquets and go to parties and drive home and read and rest and not work. "'It's like other people, you know, and I always envy girls who do such things. I'm so fond of luxury,' said Meg." trying to decide which of two shabby gowns was the least shabby. 
Well, we can't have it, so don't let us grumble, but shoulder our bundles and trudge along as cheerfully as Marmy does. I'm sure Aunt March is a regular old man of the sea to me, but I suppose when I've learned to carry her without complaining, she will tumble off, or get so light that I shan't mind her. This idea tickled Joe's fancy and put her in good spirits, but Meg didn't brighten, for her burden, consisting of four spoilt children, seemed heavier than ever. She hadn't hard enough even to make herself pretty as usual by putting on a blue neck ribbon and dressing her hair in the most becoming way. What's the use of looking nice when no one sees me but those cross midgets and no one cares whether I'm pretty or not? She muttered, shutting her drawer with a jerk. I shall have to toil and moil all my days with only little bits of fun now and then and get old and ugly and sour because I'm poor and can't enjoy my life as other girls do. It's a shame. So Meg went down, wearing an injured look and wasn't at all agreeable at breakfast time. Everyone seemed rather out of sorts and inclined to croak. Beth had a headache and lay on the sofa, trying to comfort herself with the cats and three kittens. Amy was fretting because her lessons were not learned, and she couldn't find her rubbers. Joe would whistle and make a great racket getting ready. Mrs. March was very busy trying to finish a letter, which must go at once, and Hannah had the grumps, for being up late didn't suit her. "'There never was such a cross family,' cried Joe, losing her temper when she had upset an inkstand, broken both boot lacings, and sat down upon her hat." "'You're the crossest person in it,' returned Amy, washing out the sum that was all wrong with the tears that had fallen on her slate. "'Beth, if you don't keep these horrid cats down cellar, I'll have them drowned,' exclaimed Meg angrily, as she tried to get rid of the kitten which had scrambled up her back and stuck like a burr just out of reach. Joe laughed, Meg scolded, Beth implored, and Amy wailed because she couldn't remember how much nine times twelve was." Girls, girls, do be quiet one minute. I must get this off by the early mail, and you drive me distracted with your worry, cried Mrs. March, crossing out the third spoilt sentence in her letter. There was a momentary lull, broken by Hannah, who stalked in, laid two hot turnovers on the table, and stalked out again. These turnovers were an institution, and the girls called them muffs, for they had no others, and found the hot pies very comforting to their hands on cold mornings. Hannah never forgot to make them, no matter how busy or grumpy she might be, for the walk was long and bleak. The poor things got no other lunch, and were seldom home before two. Cuddle your cats and get over your headache, Bethy. Goodbye, Marmy. We are a set of rascals this morning, but we'll come home regular angels. Now then, Meg. And Joe tramped away, feeling that the pilgrims were not setting out as they ought to do. They always looked back before turning the corner, for their mother was always at the window to nod and smile and wave her hand to them. Somehow it seemed as if they couldn't have got through the day without that, for whatever their mood might be, the last glimpse of that motherly face was sure to affect them like sunshine. If Marmy shook her fist instead of kissing her hand to us, it would serve us right, for more ungrateful wretches than we are were never seen, cried Joe, taking a remorseful satisfaction in the snowy walk and bitter wind. Don't use such dreadful expressions, said Meg, from the depths of the veil in which she had shrouded herself like a nun sick of the world. I like good, strong words that mean something, replied Joe, catching her hat as it took a leap off her head, preparatory to flying away altogether. Call yourself any names you like, but I am neither a rascal nor a wretch, and I don't choose to be called so. You're a blighted being, and decidedly cross today, because you can't sit in the lap of luxury all the time. Poor dear, just wait till I make my fortune, and you shall revel in carriages and ice cream and high-heeled slippers and posies and red-headed boys to dance with. How ridiculous you are, Joe. But Meg laughed at the nonsense, and felt better in spite of herself. Lucky for you I am, for if I put on crushed airs and tried to be dismal as you do, we should be in a nice state. Thank goodness I can always find something funny to keep me up. Don't croak any more, but come home jolly, there's a dear. Joe gave her sister an encouraging pat on the shoulder as they parted for the day, each going a different way, each hugging her little warm turnover, and each trying to be cheerful in spite of wintry weather, hard work, and the unsatisfied desires of pleasure-loving youth. When Mr. March lost his property in trying to help an unfortunate friend, the two oldest girls begged to be allowed to do something toward their own support, at least. Believing that they could not begin too early to cultivate energy, industry, and independence, their parents consented, and both fell to work with the hearty goodwill which, in spite of all obstacles, is sure to succeed at last. Margaret found a place as nursery governess, and felt rich with her small salary. As she said, she was fond of luxury, and her chief trouble was poverty. She found it harder to bear than the others, because she could remember a time when home was beautiful, life full of ease and pleasure, and want of any kind unknown. 
She tried not to be envious or discontented, but it was very natural that the young girl should long for pretty things, gay friends, accomplishments, and a happy life. At the king's, she daily saw all she wanted, for the children's older sisters were just out, and Meg caught frequent glimpses of dainty ball dresses and bouquets, heard lively gossip about theaters, concerts, sleighing parties, and merrymakings of all kinds, and saw money lavished on trifles which would have been so precious to her. Poor Meg seldom complained, but a sense of injustice made her feel bitter toward everyone sometimes, for she had not yet learned to know how rich she was in the blessings which alone can make life happy. Jo happened to suit Aunt March, who was lame, and needed an active person to wait upon her. The childless old lady had offered to adopt one of the girls when the troubles came, and was much offended because her offer was declined. Other friends told the Marches that they had lost all chance of being remembered in the rich old lady's will, but the unworldly Marches only said, We can't give up our girls for a dozen fortunes. Rich or poor, we will keep together and be happy in one another. The old lady wouldn't speak to them for a time, but happening to meet Joe at a friend's, something in her comical face and blunt manners struck the old lady's fancy, and she proposed to take her for a companion. This did not suit Joe at all, but she accepted the place since nothing better appeared, and to everyone's surprise got on remarkably well with her irascible relative. There was an occasional tempest, and once Joe had marched home declaring she couldn't bear it any longer, but Aunt March always cleared up quickly and sent for her back again with such urgency that she could not refuse, for in her heart she rather liked the peppery old lady. I suspect that the real attraction was a large library of fine books, which was left to dust and spiders since Uncle March died. Joe remembered the kind old gentleman who used to let her build railroads and bridges with his big dictionaries, tell her stories about the queer pictures in his Latin books, and buy her cards of gingerbread whenever he met her in the street. The dim, dusty room with the busts staring down from the tall bookcases, the cozy chairs, the globes, and best of all the wilderness of books in which she could wander where she liked, made the library a region of bliss to her. The moment Aunt March took her nap, or was busy with company, Jo hurried to this quiet place, and curling herself up in the easy chair devoured poetry, romance, history, travels, and pictures, like a regular bookworm. But like all happiness, it did not last long, for as sure as she had just reached the heart of the story, the sweetest verse of the song, or the most perilous adventure of her traveler, a shrill voice called, Josephine! Josephine! And she had to leave her paradise to wind yarn, wash the poodle, or read Belsham's essays by the hour together. Joe's ambition was to do something very splendid, what it was she had no idea as yet, but left it for time to tell her, and meanwhile found her greatest affliction on the fact that she couldn't read, run, and ride as much as she liked. A quick temper, sharp tongue, and restless spirit were always getting her into scrapes, and her life was a series of ups and downs which were both comic and pathetic. But the training she received at Aunt March's was just what she needed, and the thought that she was doing something to support herself made her happy, in spite of the perpetual Josephine. Beth was too bashful to go to school. It had been tried, but she suffered so much that it was given up, and she did her lessons at home with her father. Even when he went away, and her mother was called to devote her skill and energies to soldiers' aid societies, Beth went faithfully on by herself and did the best she could. She was a housewifely little creature— and helped Hannah keep home neat and comfortable for the workers, never thinking of any reward but to be loved. Long, quiet days she spent, not lonely nor idle, for her little world was peopled with imaginary friends, and she was by nature a busy bee. There were six dolls to be taken up and dressed every morning, for Beth was a child still, and loved her pets as well as ever. Not one whole or handsome one among them, all were outcasts till Beth took them in. For when her sisters outgrew these idols, they passed to her, because Amy would have nothing old or ugly. Beth cherished them all the more tenderly for that very reason, and set up a hospital for infirm dolls. No pins were ever stuck into their cotton vitals, no harsh words or blows were ever given them, no neglect ever saddened the heart of the most repulsive. But all were fed and clothed, nursed and caressed, with an affection which never failed. One forlorn fragment of dullanity had belonged to Joe and, having led a tempestuous life, was left a wreck in the rag bag, from which dreary poorhouse it was rescued by Beth and taken to her refuge. Having no top to its head, she tied on a neat little cap, and as both arms and legs were gone, she hid these deficiencies by folding it in a blanket and devoting her best bed to this chronic invalid. If anyone had known the care lavished on that dolly, I think it would have touched their hearts even while they laughed. She brought it bits of bouquets, she read to it, took it out to breathe the air hidden under her coat, she sung it lullabies, 
and never went to bed without kissing its dirty face and whispering tenderly, I hope you'll have a good night, my poor dear. Beth had her troubles as well as the others, and not being an angel, but a very human little girl, she often wept a little weep, as Joe said, because she couldn't take music lessons and have a fine piano. She loved music so dearly, tried so hard to learn, and practiced away so patiently at the jingling old instrument, that it did seem as if someone, not to hint Aunt March, ought to help her. Nobody did, however, and nobody saw Beth wipe the tears off the yellow keys that wouldn't keep in tune when she was all alone. She sang like a little lark about her work, never was too tired to play for Marmy and the girls, and day after day said hopefully to herself, I know I'll get my music sometime, if I'm good. There are many Beths in the world, shy and quiet, sitting in corners till needed, and living for others so cheerfully that no one sees the sacrifices till the little cricket on the hearth stops chirping, and the sweet, sunshiny presence vanishes, leaving silence and shadow behind. If anybody had asked Amy what the greatest trial of her life was, she would have answered at once, My nose. When she was a baby, Joe had accidentally dropped her into the coal hod, and Amy insisted that the fall had ruined her nose forever. It was not big nor red like poor Petraea's. It was only rather flat, and all the pinching in the world could not give it an aristocratic point. No one minded it but herself, and it was doing its best to grow, but Amy felt deeply the want of a Grecian nose, and drew whole sheets of handsome ones to console herself. Little Raphael, as her sisters called her, had a decided talent for drawing, and was never so happy as when copying flowers, designing fairies, or illustrating stories with queer specimens of art. Her teachers complained that, instead of doing her sums, she covered her slate with animals. The blank pages of her atlas were used to copy maps on, and caricatures of the most ludicrous description came fluttering out of all her books at unlucky moments. She got through her lessons as well as she could, and managed to escape reprimands by being a model of deportment. She was a great favorite with her mates, being good-tempered, and possessing the happy art of pleasing without effort. Her little airs and graces were much admired, so were her accomplishments, for beside her drawing, she could play twelve tunes, crochet, and read French without mispronouncing more than two-thirds of the words. She had a plaintive way of saying, when Papa was rich, we did so-and-so, which was very touching, and her long words were considered perfectly elegant by the girls. Amy was in a fair way to be spoilt, for everyone petted her, and her small vanities and selfishnesses were growing nicely. One thing, however, rather quenched the vanities. She had to wear her cousin's clothes. Now Florence's mamma hadn't a particle of taste, and Amy suffered deeply at having to wear a red instead of a blue bonnet, unbecoming gowns, and fussy aprons that did not fit. Everything was good, well-made, and little worn, but Amy's artistic eyes were much afflicted, especially this winter, when her school dress was a dull purple with yellow dots and no trimming. My only comfort, she said to Meg with tears in her eyes, is that mother don't take tucks in my dresses whenever I'm naughty as Maria Parks's mother does. My dear, it's really dreadful, for sometimes she is so bad her frock is up to her knees and she can't come to school. And when I think of this degradation, I feel that I can bear even my flat nose and purple gown with yellow skyrockets on it. Meg was Amy's confidant and monitor, and, by some strange attraction of opposites, Joe was gentle Beth's. To Joe alone did the shy child tell her thoughts, and over her big harem-scarum sister, Beth unconsciously exercised more influence than anyone in the family. The two older girls were a great deal to one another, but each took one of the younger into her keeping and watched over her in her own way. Playing mother, they called it, and put their sisters in the places of discarded dolls, with the maternal instinct of little women. "'Has anybody got anything to tell? "'It's been such a dismal day I'm really dying for some amusement,' said Meg, "'as they sat sewing together that evening. "'I had a queer time with Aunt today, and as I got the best of it, I'll tell you about it,' "'began Joe, who dearly loved to tell stories. "'I was reading that everlasting Belsham and droning away as I always do, "'for Aunt soon drops off, and then I take out some nice book and read like fury till she wakes up. "'I actually made myself sleepy, and before she began to nod, "'I gave such a gait that she asked me what I meant "'by opening my mouth wide enough to take the whole book in at once. "'I wish I could and be done with it,' said I, trying not to be saucy. "'Then she gave me a long lecture on my sins "'and told me to sit and think them over "'while she just lost herself for a moment. "'She never finds herself very soon, "'so the minute her cap began to bob like a top-heavy dahlia, "'I whipped the vicar of Wakefield out of my pocket "'and read away, with one eye on him and one on Aunt.' I'd just got to where they all tumbled into the water when I forgot and laughed out loud. Aunt woke up, and, being more good-natured after her nap, told me to read a bit and show what frivolous work I preferred to the worthy and instructive Belsham. 
I did my very best, and she liked it, though she only said, I don't understand what it's all about. Go back and begin it, child. Back I went, and made the primroses as interesting as ever I could. Once I was wicked enough to stop in a thrilling place and say meekly, I'm afraid it tires you, ma'am. Shan't I stop now? She caught up her knitting, which had dropped out of her hands, gave me a sharp look through her specs, and said in her short way, Finish the chapter and don't be impertinent, miss. Did she own she liked it? asked Meg. Oh, bless you, no. But she let old Belsham rest, and when I ran back after my gloves this afternoon, there she was, so hard at the vicar that she didn't hear me laugh as I danced the jig in the hall, because of the good time coming. What a pleasant life she might have if she only chose. I don't envy her much in spite of her money, for after all, rich people have about as many worries as poor ones, I think, added Joe. That reminds me, said Meg, that I've got something to tell. It isn't funny like Joe's story, but I thought about it a good deal as I came home. At the King's today I found everybody in a flurry, and one of the children said that her oldest brother had done something dreadful, and Papa had sent him away. I heard Mrs. King crying and Mr. King talking very loud, and Grace and Ellen turned away their faces when they passed me, so I shouldn't see how red their eyes were. I didn't ask any questions, of course, but I felt so sorry for them, and was rather glad I hadn't any wild brothers to do wicked things and disgrace the family. I think being disgraced in school is a great deal tryinger than anything bad boys can do, said Amy, shaking her head as if her experience of life had been a deep one. Susie Perkins came to school today with a lovely red carnelian ring. I wanted it dreadfully, and wished I was her with all my might. Well, she drew a picture of Mr. Davis with a monstrous nose and a hump, and the words, Young ladies, my eye is upon you, coming out of his mouth in a balloon thing. We were laughing over it, when all of a sudden his eye was on us, and he ordered Susie to bring up her slate. She was paralyzed with fright, but she went, and oh, what do you think he did? He took her by the ear, the ear, just fancy how horrid, and led her to the recitation platform and made her stand there half an hour, holding that slate so everyone could see. Didn't the girls laugh at the picture? asked Joe, who relished the scrape. Laugh, not one. They sat as still as mice, and Susie cried quartz, I know she did. I didn't envy her then, for I felt that millions of carnelian rings wouldn't have made me happy after that. I never, never should have got over such an agonizing mortification. And Amy went on with her work in the proud consciousness of virtue and the successful utterance of two long words in a breath. I saw something that I liked this morning, and I meant to tell it at dinner, but I forgot, said Beth, putting Joe's topsy-turvy basket in order as she talked. When I went to get some oysters for Hannah, Mr. Lawrence was in the fish shop, but he didn't see me, for I kept behind a barrel, and he was busy with Mr. Cutter, the fishman. A poor woman came in, with a pail and a mop and asked Mr. Cutter if he would let her do some scrubbing for a bit of fish, because she hadn't any dinner for her children, and had been disappointed of a day's work. Mr. Cutter was in a hurry, and said no, rather crossly, so she was going away, looking hungry and sorry, when Mr. Lawrence hooked up a big fish with the crooked end of his cane and held it out to her. She was so glad and surprised, she took it right in her arms and thanked him over and over. He told her to go along and cook it, and she hurried off so happy. Wasn't it good of him? Oh, she did look so funny hugging the big slippery fish and hoping Mr. Lawrence's bed in heaven would be easy. When they had laughed at Beth's story, they asked their mother for one, and after a moment's thought, she said soberly, As I sat cutting out blue flannel jackets today at the rooms, I felt very anxious about Father and thought how lonely and helpless we should be if anything happened to him. It was not a wise thing to do, but I kept on worrying till an old man came in with an order for some clothes. He sat down near me, and I began to talk to him, for he looked poor and tired and anxious. "'Have you sons in the army?' I asked, for the note he brought was not to me. "'Yes, ma'am. I had four, but two were killed. One is a prisoner, and I'm going to the other who is very sick in a Washington hospital,' he answered quietly. "'You have done a great deal for your country, sir,' I said, feeling respect now instead of pity." Not a mite more than I ought, ma'am. I'd go myself if I was any use, as I ain't. I give my boys, and I give them free. He spoke so cheerfully, looked so sincere, and seemed so glad to give his all, that I was ashamed of myself. I'd given one man, and thought it too much, while he gave four without grudging them. I had all my girls to comfort me at home, and his last son was waiting miles away to say goodbye to him, perhaps. I felt so rich, so happy, thinking of my blessings, that I made him a nice bundle, gave him some money, and thanked him heartily for the lesson he had taught. Tell another story, Mother, one with a moral to it like this. 
I like to think about them afterwards, if they are real and not too preachy, said Joe after a minute's silence. Mrs. March smiled and began at once, for she had told stories to this little audience for many years and knew how to please them. Once upon a time, there were four girls who had enough to eat and drink and wear, a good many comforts and pleasures, kind friends and parents who loved them dearly, and yet they were not contented. Here the listeners stole sly looks at one another and began to sew diligently. These girls were anxious to be good and made many excellent resolutions, but they did not keep them very well and were constantly saying, if we only had this, or if we could only do that, quite forgetting how much they already had and how many pleasant things they actually could do. So they asked an old woman what spell they could use to make them happy, and she said, when you feel discontented, think over your blessings and be grateful. Here Joe looked up quickly, as if about to speak, but changed her mind, seeing that the story was not done yet. Being sensible girls, they decided to try her advice, and soon were surprised to see how well off they were. One discovered that money couldn't keep shame and sorrow out of rich people's houses. Another that, though she was poor, she was a great deal happier with her youth, health, and good spirits than a certain fretful, feeble old lady who couldn't enjoy her comforts. A third that, disagreeable as it was to help get dinner, it was harder still to have to go begging for it. And the fourth, that even carnelian rings were not so valuable as good behavior. So they agreed to stop complaining, to enjoy the blessings already possessed, and try to deserve them, lest they should be taken away entirely instead of increased and I believe they were never disappointed or sorry that they took the old woman's advice. Now, Marmy, that is very cunning of you to turn our own stories against us and give us a sermon instead of a romance, cried Meg. I like that kind of sermon. It's the sort Father used to tell us, said Beth thoughtfully, putting the needle straight on Joe's cushion. I don't complain near as much as the others do, and I shall be more careful than ever now, for I've had warning from Susie's downfall, said Amy morally. We needed that lesson. And we won't forget it. If we do, you just say to us, as old Chloe did in Uncle Tom, Tink of your mercies, children. Tink of your mercies, added Joe, who could not, for the life of her, help getting a morsel of fun out of the little sermon, though she took it to heart as much as any of them. Mm -hmm.